Hello and welcome back to Boring Dad Gaming, where today I think we're going to be finishing Citizen Sleeper. Um, I don't know how much is left, but we'll find out. If you know, if there's more than fits in an episode, we'll we'll, we'll carry on further. But um, we'll see how it goes. Uh, so uh, when we left off, I said that I'd sort of play through sleeping cycles until uh, the plot advanced. In fact, I only had to sleep the once. All I did with my dice that remaining day was to pick a few mushrooms, plant a few mushrooms, um, went to bed, and when I woke up, I've got this. I've got peak slate chirping in my pocket. You take it out. A message. The connection is ready. Meet me at the Founders Gap, Greenway side. Peak. You clench your jaw. It's time. So we're right there. We only need to scroll over to here. You find Peak waiting near where you first met, at the entrance to the docking tunnel for the Founders' Ferry. They are leaning beside the wall in the flickering light, and you realise now how different they look from when you first met. There is a darkness around their eyes, a sense of exhaustion to their pose, but also a solidity, a sense of purpose and self-knowledge. They look concrete, for want of a better word, solid. Sleeper! They spot you and a small smile crosses their face. Glad you came. Of course. The break in the connection is up ahead. They walk away from the docking tunnel into a ragged, half-crushed corridor that descends into darkness. They poke their slate and a torch flicks on, lighting the way ahead. As you descend through the layers of the broken edge of the eye, Peak talks, filling the silence. I had a hunt all over this part of the eye to find the point where the connection was broken. They run a hand along the buckled metal of the wall stooping under the angled ceiling. This hole, the gap, got knocked in the eye when Solheim collapsed. It's impossible to tell who did it. But my guess is they tried to scuttle the eye. If Solheim couldn't keep hold of their fancy new station, well, no one could. Peak ducks through a fractured passageway with hanging wires like vines. So, this place has always been on borrowed time. I've managed to weave together the old connections and run a new patch down to where the main line still runs through the remaining ribs of the rim. They smile. Just like keeping those old XPR platforms running. <laughs> Esh would be proud if she'd bothered to help. As Peak goes quiet, the corridor opens out into a wider, twisted passage with compartments on either side thick with wiring. Here, this is the connection point. You can see where Peek has levered off a panel and hooked up a thick cable to the existing hardware. As thick as a tree trunk, it snakes off into the dark ahead, its yellow rings making it look like some huge and exotic serpent. You did all this? Peek nods. Yeah, it was an interesting challenge. Plus it helped me keep my mind off things. Peek smiles a weak smile. <laughs> There's a lot I'd prefer not to think about. You both stand there, staring at the point where the new cable meets the old one. The ends separate, fitted with multi-pin male and female connectors, and braced inside a metal framework with a scissoring mechanism. Bring them together, seal them, and the greenway will be connected to the rest of the eye for the first time in decades. Peak shifts their weight onto one hip, pushing their hair out of their eyes. I feel like this should be more momentous, like there should be some, I don't know, ritual or ceremony. They pause. Or maybe someone should stop us from doing this crazy thing, eh? It isn't crazy. Peak nods. I mean, I'm not being funny, sleeper, but this whole thing is crazy to me. Peak shakes the head. Leaving Hawthorne with Ish? Joining the flotilla? Coming here? Meeting you? The flux? The shadow? Oh, everything! They laugh a hollow laugh. So I suppose this is the at least consistent with all that. They take a deep breath. Okay. They look at you with mild panic. They hold both sides of the supporting framework ready to scissor it closed. Here we go. Peak wrenches, sorry, Peak wrenches the framework closed and the connectors thunk together with a sound that echoes down the ruined corridor into the dark on both sides. Both you and Peak wait with bated breath, unsure what it is you are waiting for. Do you expect the eye to suddenly stop spinning or lurch on its axis? For the power to go out or a shockwave to run through the corridors of the rim? You meet Peak's eyes and suddenly they burst out laughing. <laughs> what are we waiting for? They put a hand to their forehead. I feel like we just planted a tree and are expecting it to burst out of the ground. They shake their head. But you feel it. You feel it flowing like a stream that has been released from a cave and rushes out into the sunlight, crystalline and clear. You swear you can hear it running in the wires like water 
like rain, like steam. It doesn't roar or rattle, but it rustles and writhes there like liquid roots. Peek sees the look in your eyes and stops laughing. You can see it, can't you? You can't see it, not with your eyes at least, but it is everywhere, and now it is out. It can't be put back in, that much is clear. You imagine the rim of the eye like a sponge, like soil soaking up the gardener in their chorus, the gaps filling with a burbling, constant growing life. Peek stares at you, waiting for something, anything. The gardener is free. Peek nods slowly and closes their eyes. They go to speak, but the words fail them. Suddenly, Peek's slate chirps. They jump and scramble for it, almost dropping it in the process. But when they stare at it, a look of confusion crosses their face. Is it the gardener? Peek's mouth falls open. Oh, it's Ish. They swallow. She's leaving. They look at you with panic. Before you can speak, they've turned away and are moving back up the passageway, back towards the entrance. Peek! They don't turn, don't respond, and you watch their silhouette, lit by their slate's torch, disappear rapidly around a corner. You take out the slate Pete gave you and turn on the torch. The wires all around look like pale roots in the harsh light, and you turn away from them. They're the gardeners now. You work your way back through the corridors, retracing your steps. You imagine Peek, panicked, running towards the cordon, realising that their greatest fear has come to pass. You wonder if they'll be able to persuade Esh to stay. If Esh is going, you think, then the flotilla must be leaving too. The thought makes you shiver in the darkness and you push it away. You're not ready. You focus on avoiding the hanging wires, the low ceilings, and make your way back out into the lit corridors of the Founder's Ferry Dock. Castor is waiting for you. He holds up his hands. Now, now, sleeper, no need to fear. He raises his eyebrows. I understand now it was my mistake to try to force you. A miscalculation. Why are you here? Good, good. Questions are good. He pushes his glasses up his nose. I am more than happy to answer any you may have. I won't hold you here, sleeper. Castor stands to the side. But I wish to speak. Listen. You stop, giving Castor his opportunity. Castor nods. At first I thought that... <laughs> If you'll excuse the turn of freeze, taking possession of your particular talents was the opportunity. He smiles a broad smile. But you were more than that, and I understand that now. Your arrival on this station, your ability to touch the networks, this makes you the very definition of a wild card. He touches the rim of his glasses. Senate stats analysis, my analysis, we could never have accounted for you. This system, the Halion system, is about to experience a significant change. About to open up to Senate stats bailiffs, Conway's claimants, and every industry and element an active can channel brings. Yet this very cycle, you let another wild card free, Gardner. I have to admit, this development makes me afraid, sleeper. Makes me afraid what an intelligence like this will sacrifice to protect itself. Or what atrocities it might commit through madness. And yet, Castor's eyes glint. What a compelling object such an intelligence is. Let me protect you, mark you out, keep Senate stat from eliminating by force or legal expediency you as they will with every other squatter on this ring. Castor clasps their hands together. And in exchange, when Senate stat comes for this place, you facilitate the handover. You calm the protocols. You give us the gardener. No. Castor takes off their glasses and polishes them. Disappointing. You begin to leave. As you approach, he speaks quietly, an urgent whisper. I do not wish to see you lost. You are of great value, if you ever want to see that realized. You push past, ignoring him, and his voice fades. The last you see of him is his slow nod, perhaps a mark of resignation, or just another deferential gesture aimed at manipulating your response. It doesn't matter either way. You're done with him. You head towards the cordon, peak and the flotilla in the forefront of your mind. No active drives. Well. What do we have going on here? Three cycles left. Ooh, uh, uh, 
Yeah, that one's already gone. They said they would. You arrive into chaos at the cordon. The final shuttles are leaving the ramshackle docks that are formed along the edge of the gap and during the flotilla's stay. As they do, groups of evacuees push on board, hoping to be among the final people to escape from the eye. The fear created by the flux event became a series of rumours, and those rumours have driven many out of their homes. Others have staunchly doubled down on their position on the eye, refusing to accept any gossip of a second collapse. You're unsure what you think. Is the collapse a certainty? Will Peak's actions this cycle have changed anything at all? You're tired of these questions and instead set out to look for your friends. You quickly spot Peak and Esh at the far side of the chaotic bay. You quickly make your way through the crowds, slipping between the gaps in the rushing evacuees, stepping over bags and luggage. Progress is slow, but as you approach you can hear their voices over the crowd. You try to push closer, but there are many evacuees gathered around them in their shuttle. You've made your decision, Peak, and it puts you against me. Esh is standing with one foot on the boarding ramp while Peak argues with her. The evacuees are eyeing them, eager to intervene, but intimidated by Esh's evident strength and attitude. Ish, it doesn't have to be like this. Peak looks desperate, tear tracks already on their cheeks. We can find a way. Esh shakes her head. I've always protected you, Peak. I've taken you under my wing. But I understand that you're not mind control. And you've chosen, chosen to be here and not with me, despite everything. I've chosen to stop running. Peek cries out in frustration. You can choose to stop running too. Or you can stay here and try to live. Don't you remember what it feels like to live, Esh? Esh turns away. I remember what it was like to live on Hawthorne. What it was like to be worried for your safety every cycle. To live under the control of my mother, of the administration. To work to maintain something that no one wanted. No one needed so that our corporation could maintain a foothold in this system. You talk as if this place, in the very same system, is any different. What is there here but the same grind for other masters, for employers, administrators, for those who gain from our struggles? There may not be a corporation controlling the eye, but there is control, there is power in action here. So what then? Peek shouts. You run from anyone or everyone who could ever be close to you in search of freedom? In search of some perfect place where no one has power over you? Peek is crying openly now. I want to be part of something-ish, even if it's broken and suffering, even if it cannot be free. Esh pauses and takes a deep breath. She nods, her eyes closed. This isn't Hawthorne anymore. We aren't tied by our childhood or by our shared need to escape. We are both just people in this system. She clo opens her eyes. I release you, Peek. You are free of me. Ish, please. They hold out a hand. There's a laugh here if you want it. Esh turns and smiles at Peek, her eyes wet now too. Then live it for me, Peek. I can't. As she climbs up the boarding ramp, the evacuees taking their chance to climb on board too. You watch as the shuttle closes its ramp, lifts off and leaves the bay. The crowds are dispersing now as they get onto the shuttles or say their goodbyes and you move back into the main part of the cordon. You push past the last of them to reach Peek. Peek doesn't turn as you come closer. Sleeper. Here she's gone. You should go too. I think we might go. <laughs> Peek shakes her head. No, I'm sure now. They look out at the flotilla. This is the way it should be. They turn to face you. I'll miss the briar, but she'll serve Ish well. I know that. Sleeper. The shout takes you by surprise, and as you turn, you see Sol coming across the bay towards you, the last two shuttles loading up behind him. He reaches you, his suit hissing as he does. Can't believe you'd make an old man run across the bay to get to you. <laughs> he pauses to take a breath. The singers have gone. They left at the start of the cycle. They broke away from the flotilla. You smile as you think of Tala, safely cradled within one of those singer ships, on her way to the Starwood Belt, and hopefully a reunion with her brother. Godspeed, Tala. What are you smiling at? Sol interrupts your thoughts. They forced our hand. We have to leave now. Sol shakes his head. If we follow close enough behind, maybe they'll end up being our scouts anyway. I reckon any hostile spaces out there will give them a wide berth. Pilgrim Seed, we need a little time to make our way out of the cordon, but I'm heading back now to get her started. Thankfully, the step ships are sticking with us, so we'll be plenty well supplied for the journey to the belt. <laughs> he pauses. Anyway, I didn't plot all the way over here to tell you that. 
Sol looks between you and Peek with a raised eyebrow. It's now or never, sleeper. I'm good to my word and I kept a berth for you, but this is your last chance to take it. He scratches at his beard. Make a call. Hmm. You glance out at the flotilla beyond the bay. Beautiful in the light of Helion's sun. You think of the long journey to the starward belt, of the people inside the pilgrim seed, of the possible futures that await. Then you think of the people here, on the eye, of peak beside you, of the small shifts yet to come and the routines that ground you, of promises and possibilities. So this is the choice, leave or stay. And I'm inclined to leave, and my thinking for that is I was inclined to stay on the eye until we learned all about the corporations coming back and um, taking over and kind of jettisoning everyone who's here. Like, I think our efforts to save the station probably will succeed. I'm not, that's not the reason why I would leave. It's just, I think, I think our time here has come to an end. I think we, I think we go on with the flotilla and um, strike out for pastures new. So, yeah, that's what I'm going to do. We're going to leave. You open your mouth to speak and realise this is the final time you will have to make this choice. You have to be sure. I'm leaving. You say the words and they seem to carry your heart out of your mouth with them. You feel light-headed, spinning, as if you tumbled out of the bay into open space. Sol nods. Come on then, let's go. You freeze for a moment, feeling Peek's presence beside you, and the moment to speak disappears. I'm sorry, Peek. Peek shakes their head. I understand, sleeper. They pause. I hope you find a home someday. I kind of wish Peek would come with us. Um, you know, I think uh, part of the choice was whether you felt like you'd bonded more with Peek or Esh, and I feel like our characters bonded more with Peek on that side of the equation. But um, I also, as I said, I feel like our time on the eye has, has come to an end, and um, it's better for us to move on. And then you are walking with Sol across the bay, almost without trying. Your step light and your head spinning. Sol grips your hand to help you up onto the shuttle ramp, and as he does, you feel the thick texture of his worn hands in great detail, as if you were touching some cratered landscape. You grip them tightly as you get on board. As the ramp begins to close, you see Peak watching at a distance, their face half covered by their hair. They raise a hand in farewell, and as they do, you see something in their expression that you can't quite place. A sense of determination, perhaps, or a compressed anger. Something that will drive them forward from this point on, to a future you can believe will be better. And then the shuttle ramp closes, and the metal box you are inside rumbles and tilts. Some of the evacuees with you screech at the sudden movement, but they settle as the ship carves its way out of the bay towards the flotilla towards whatever comes next. When you arrive there, you will find a berth, just as Sol promised, tucked in among hundreds of others, like a strange neighbourhood of tiny flats. The communal canteens, the water supply, the farm stacks, these shared spaces will become the centre of this new reality. The places where stories are shared, where signals and messages from the ships of the system and the eye itself are interpreted and discussed you will find yourself unable to resist listening. Listening in to any conversation about the eye, any scrap of data or detail. This is how you will hear that another flux event hit not long after the flotilla left. One that knocked out the power for the whole free spoke, they say, disconnecting the hub from the rim for many cycles. One that crippled many systems and cost many lives. But the flotilla having departed with enough time, will outrun the flux, and you and all the evacuees will be thankful for this mercy. You will also hear of the strange growths that people started reporting around the station in the wake of this event, fungal crusts that pushed through pipes and wiring. Rumours of the eye going wild and fecund will travel quickly around the Pilgrim Seed, telling stories of a station of increasing unpredictability prone to a seasonal rhythm of spore clouds and sudden growth spurts. As your long journey across the system becomes a dull routine of the same faces and places, you will delight to overhear that the eye persists despite everything, that crippled systems are rebooted and replaced, that the new seasons of growth and decay bring with them 
a plentitude of resources and surprises. You will hear that Havenage's hardliners have fizzled out, losing their grip on the Havenage Council. In their wake, Helene will spearhead a series of reforms that will scale back Havenage's overreach, returning them to the caretaker role they had always intended to fulfil. You see, uh, this is the sort of aerial view, if you like, of the, the eye. I think this is the first time we've seen it from this angle. It's quite nice. And after a long time, you will find the stories of the eye become less, the signals and messages fewer. Replaced instead by a new array of broadcasts, this time from Senate Stat, stating legal precedents and quoting deeds of ownership, staking a claim on the system. These messages will set the rumour mill of the pilgrim seeds spinning, and you will rarely have a moment when you don't hear mention of that company and its claims. Occasionally, on the long trip, you'll make a pilgrimage to the dust houses on a supply shuttle and gather club heads from among the mulch. You'll talk with Aki as they are processed into stabiliser. <laughs> Aki's not the one being t processed into stabiliser, it's the club heads. Um, you'll talk with Aki as they're being processed into stabiliser and hear of how the plants are changing, adapting, becoming ever intertwined in this new and unprecedented ecosystem. And then, in the final part of your journey, as you reach the far parts of the system where few signals travel, and the Starwood Belt girds the system like a defensive ring. There will be distant reports of another fleet entering the system under the banner of the all too familiar Conway Extractions. By the time this happens, you and the evacuees will begin to discuss these events less and less, perhaps in the hope of avoiding being implicated in the coming corporate war. And finally, one cycle far from this moment, you will arrive at an asteroid port in the Starwood Belt one you have yet to know, and you and all the evacuees will be released onto it. In that moment, half a system and hundreds of cycles away from the eye, you will think back on your time there with equal sadness and fondness. And then you will step out of the pilgrim seed never to return, and once more try to make a future for yourself that might be different to those false futures promised to you by so many promised to you so many times. But for now, you remain on the shuttle, angling its way towards the bays of the Pilgrim Seed, carrying the hopes of all who tremble quietly within it. And in this moment, you feel the eye release you, just as Esh released Peak, and it feels so good. Wow. <laughs> oh, I'm a bit touched by that. Uh, well. That was Citizen Sleeper. That, uh, that was um, my canon ending. Um, we were given lots of opportunities for an ending. Uh, the Gardener leaving on the Sidereal Horizon. Um, we could have left with the Bounty Hunter as well. That was still open to us at the end. Um, but I, I like this one. Um, you know, we, we did all we could on, on the station. We saved it. But beyond the flux event it, it, it was very much going to become a corporate trading place by the sound of it so i think i think it was the right decision to leave it'd be interesting to know what happens to us when the flux does hit because it sounds like you know it did it did have an impact um but no mention of, of what happened to peak or the others who were there um but yeah no really really good and i, I hope you've enjoyed this it's uh, i know it was a a bit of a big hiatus in the middle of the series while we were waiting for this final DLC chapter to be released. Um, but hopefully it was worth it. And thank you very much for everyone who's stuck with it for this long to, to watch the season, the series in its entirety. And um, I hope you've enjoyed it. You know, if you have, please do like this video. Leave me a comment. Let me know what you think about the story, about the decision I made at the end to leave versus to stay. What, what would you have done? Let me know. And... Uh, yeah, if you're watching this and you haven't already subscribed to Boring Dead Gaming, it'd be great if you could. It'd be great to have you as part of the community. So thanks very much, one last time, and I'm going to say I hope to see you elsewhere on Boring Dead Gaming for other playthroughs. At the moment, I'm, I'm working through Dredge, which I'm enjoying very, very much. And, you know, if you enjoyed this, then you, I think you'd enjoy that as well, so please check it out. Um, but otherwise, I'll hope to see you elsewhere on the channel in the future. Bye for now. <laughs>